So now we're going to um, hear from Sabrina Fernandez. She is a Brazilian eco-socialist organizer, writer, and communicator with a PhD in sociology. Welcome, Sabrina. Thanks for having me. I hope you can all hear me well. I think it's all right, the sound, right? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for the invitation to participate. Uh, currently, it's the evening of yesterday in Brazil. <laughs> so I'm talking from far away, but it's great to be able to share some of the experiences. I have read the, the manifesto as well, and I have some thoughts on that. So I hope we can have uh, a really great productive, re actually productive exchange today. So I'm looking forward to it. I wanted to start by making a point that Brazil has gone through such extensive ethnocide of indigenous peoples that we don't get to uh, acknowledge a particular piece of land. Most people don't know uh, like we, which ethnicity that land belonged to. So this is a problem for us in terms of the ethnocide. And for example, I'm right here in the capital of Brazil, Brasilia. We know there is Guajajara and, and Cariri Chocó land in our midst. But just recently, 2014, during the World Cup, the government exchanged a piece of sacred indigenous land with a construction company in order to finance one of the World Cup stadiums. So this kind of uh, expropriation of indigenous land is still ongoing. And in the near future, within the next few days, we're going through a, a process, actually a judiciary process and judgment within the Supreme Court that's going to decide if indigenous peoples can only settle land that they have uh, been able to prove that they occupied in, a, in 1988 when our current uh, constitution was established. So this means that all sorts of indigenous peoples who have been expelled from their land, they would lose their claim to the land. So this is a huge battle that we're going on right now that they just, they want to uh, actually just uh, forget about all the situation of expelling people and genocide that happened before the, this recent past, before this past 30 years. So this is one of the main challenges. Also considering that indigenous peoples are big targets for COVID right now. So in terms of infections, we do know that uh, black people in Brazil and indigenous peoples in Brazil, they have a higher rate per capita of being infected and also less access to good public health care here in Brazil. Uh, it's part of the situation right now where over 150,000 dead regarding COVID. We know that these numbers are vastly underestimated. Uh, the government insists on not actually testing people and everything is just opening up without a proper recourse to protecting workers. So it's a situation of, uh, from the beginning, uh, big, big business owners pressuring the government to keep everything open, uh, open not really uh, enforcing any sort of social distancing. Uh, we, we have a culture in Brazil that's quite backwards in terms of this um, legacy of slavery. So this means that a lot of people of the higher classes in Brazil, they have living mates. So these living housekeepers that they would not release to go home to their children, but during the pandemic still had to work uh, at their own peril. So we also know of many women that are involved in this uh, social reproduction labor also being at risk and dying. Uh, in some states, the first people to die were these uh, women housekeepers. So the situation is uh, quite complicated here. We're dealing with a far-right government. This far-right government uh, was losing popularity, but right now, because of the emergency income that was actually rejected by the government, the, the federal government, but Congress was able to pass to help out during the pandemic, the President Jair Bolsonaro took credit for this emergency income, so that has helped his popularity to rise a little bit again. So it's part of the challenges. We're also going to, through municipal elections right now and right-wing leaders tend to be uh, first in the, in the polls. So um, situation is quite bad when we look into the Ministry of the Environment as well. 
the Minister of the Environment has actually been convicted of environmental fraud regarding mining companies, and he was appointed, I think, perhaps for that reason, uh, particularly because uh, Bolsonaro at some point said he didn't even want to have a ministry for the environment. This means that, for example, the national budget for fighting climate change was cut by 95%. So basically, there's no initiative for fighting climate change in Brazil right now, aside from grassroots mobilizations and uh, different NGOs. Another problem with this is that they cut the budget for fighting fires in the different biomes. We have five huge biomes in Brazil that are very important for our biodiversity. Uh, mostly internationally, we hear about the Amazon and most recently Pantanal, but all of our biomes are very endangered right now. Cerrado, where I live, is a, suppose, uh, people think it's sort of like a savanna-like biome, but because of the power of agribusiness, it's becoming more savanna-like when you used to have more dense forest. So this is part of our challenges right now. Um, deforestation is on the rise, these fires are on the rise, and the federal government simply does not care or even has the, gut, the guts to blame indigenous people, saying that indigenous peoples are setting fire in the forest to try to incriminate his government. So it's also a period of very strong cynicism and fake news uh, are abound. Coming from this situation, sometimes people think it's quite odd to be talking about revolution and eco-socialism and dreaming of a completely different radical scenario, but I believe that this is exactly what we need right now. The pandemic um, uh, it, it also presents us with what we, we would say not a window of opportunity. I think it could become complicated to frame it that way, but a window of responsibility. Since we're dealing uh, like as Greta, as you mentioned, Greta talked about uh, the sense of emergency, knowing what em an emergency looks like. We have a window of responsibility for avoiding further emergencies that could be much, much worse. Like we've been following up, for example, um, not only Mike Davis, but uh, with the Global Eco Socialist Network, we were with also Mike Davis and Rob Wallace last week. And uh, Rob's work has been really good for informing us into, like, this is not just the beginning this is not like what it is it's just the beginning we might be facing much worse situations and we need to be prepared for that but i think even better prepare to avoid those situations um we i've been working here in brazil in terms of organizing with different different collectives and within the party as well with the prospect of what a green new deal coming from brazil could look like what would be the difference? What would be the perspective coming from a country that's perceived as, uh, at the same time, like this horde of bio biodiversity for the world, but also this huge sink of uh, mineral resources that can be exploited. We, we have oil nowadays. We have lots of different mineral resources that imperialist forces look to gather, and they, they even contributed to a coup against a democratically elected president, Juma Rousseff. It was a very mis misogynistic, sexist coup as well. And part of this we know are related to the neoliberal agenda and the agenda of privatization. Right now we're fighting the privatization of Petrobras, the national oil company. We're fighting the privatization of the, post, uh, the postal system and many other companies as well. In fact, Jeff Bezos from Amazon is, is actually interested in purchasing our, our national postal system. So we know everything is quite related. Uh, because of this, we've been talking about a perspective of eco-socialism from the margins, eco-socialism from the South that recognizes a, a, a contradiction that we face when we're talking about radical change, which is the fact that uh, capitalism does not operate in the same way everywhere. Uh, here, we're dealing with a country that the GDP is very much informed uh, by commodities. Commodity exports that are related to monocrops, that are related to mining disasters, and that are very important when people look into the financial market. So there's this fin financialization of the agribusiness system here that sometimes I think that even the left is not quite aware of how far it's gotten. 
Um, we're talking about, for example, the fact that in terms of our commodities, uh, soy is our biggest commodity and it's being exported, for example, to China to feed livestock. So that also that is also connected to agribusiness in other countries. And also in terms when we talk about technology, there's a matter of deindustrialization in Brazil. And this means that sometimes the traditional left thinks that if we are to overcome dependent capitalism, so looking to this center periphery analysis, then we must just industrialize the same way that the US, that Europe has industrialized. And us eco-socialists here, our point as eco-socialists is to fight this sort of perspective that is not about industrializing like the North. It's about providing a different mode of production that would give us sovereignty so we're less, uh, less susceptible, less vulnerable to coups and to matters of sanctions that we know this is one of the main economic weapons today. So for example, against Venezuela, against Cuba, the, the US is in, imposes sanctions and the, the European Union also has that power. So we need to be able to be more autonomous, but it doesn't mean exploiting our natural resources and treating them as economic resources uh, rather than natural goods and perhaps natural rights. Uh, we think that one of the challenges that we ha have nowadays is mobil mobilizing our labor unions. So one of the situations when we're talking about building this independent move, movement, as uh, it's talked about in the manifesto, to support such, such a transition, we need to uh, try to convince labor unions to go in this direction uh, that talks about a different type of growth, more related to quality of living, uh, reclaiming the power of reducing the work week as one of our main goals, one of our main challenges, and talking about different types of technologies. So rather than thinking about exploiting the pre-salt layer of oil in Brazil, that sometimes the, the oil labor union, they talk about it as, well, this is going to guarantee us a hundred years of sovereignty. And I'm always saying we don't have a hundred years. We, we can't afford that. So it's a challenge to maybe think, how can we fight privatization? Because we know that it is foreign powers get a hold of our pre-salt layer, then we're definitely, we're, we're definitely screwed. There's no way out of this. So we need to retain worker sovereignty here, uh, get the company under worker control, but also work with these workers to fight for training, for transition, and uh, going back into a moment that about 10 years ago, Petrobras was actually involved in investing in solar and wind. And now that's being dismounted and they're just basically going back to just oil. So this is part of a challenge of politicization nowadays. Uh, we're also dealing with the situation uh, regarding unemployment. So one of our points that we've been trying to emphasize is that we need a job guarantee. This has to be one of the priorities. There's no uh, possibility that we'll be able to convince people that we need to make this sort of radical reforms this decade without a job guarantee because most people believe that jobs are associated with not only capitalism, but this trend of capitalism nowadays with informal, informal labor and just industrialization everywhere. So this is quite important for us is also uh, really fundamental that we discuss uh, not only the settlement of indigenous properties, the indigenous territories, but also talking about agrarian reform. Brazil uh, has one of the uh, biggest inequalities when it comes to land. And this reflects in our GDP and also reflects in terms of the violence against uh, against environmentalists, against uh, campesinos, uh, landless workers. So this is one of our challenges as well. And this relates to the matter of technology all around. What kind of technology that we want to develop here and how we're being actually exploited to provide what can look like green technologies to more developed countries. So uh, as you are aware, uh, just recently, Luis Arce was elected president of Bolivia. So uh, defeating the coup 
that removed uh, Evo Morales, asked Evo Morales to resign last year. We are aware that Mas and Morales, they have a lot of environmental contradictions. So as much as they talked about Pachamama and the Cochabamba Accords, they were also uh, trying to conciliate with these foreign mining companies, that being a problem. But we know that it's more possible to dispute the, these different meanings within the left than when the right is in power. And so right now in Brazil, our challenge is fighting Bolsonaro, but also mobilizing the left to think in a different way so we don't just deliver these goods. And for example, one of the things that that's quite important right now that we're talking about municipal elections is public transportation. Uh, there are, we have estimates nowadays of about 7 million uh, electrical vehicles around the world. And uh, the eco-capitalists, like green capitalism, has been arguing that, well, if we are to meet our quotas for uh, getting rid of carbon, then we need 350 million electrical vehicles in the U.S. alone. This is absurd, not only in terms of uh, how it keeps the individualized way of mobility that's quite, quite uh, exclusive, exclu excludes a lot of people, but also how it actually, uh, it actually increases ele electricity demand by, in, like, by over 40%. And when we're talking about at least getting rid of like 80% of uh, carbon in our energy demand. So the thinking nowadays is still very much uh, related to green capitalism. This is our challenge. Uh, most of the time, like, well, we have like these uh, right wing sort of like that are trying to look progressive and greener, talking about a Green New Deal in Brazil that's all pro-private sector, that's all related to actually giving subsidies to the private sector that will be able to sell us the services back. So talking about the public sector for me is like one of our main goals, making sure that we retain things in the public sector, but not just in any way, politicizing the workers involved so that we can also have our own targets, our own domestic internal targets that can strengthen countries against imperialist forces, against intervention, make us strong enough that if a sanction is imposed, we can deal with that by ourselves. But at the same time, thinking internationally, because we know climate change is a global is a global problem. So there's no such thing as socialism in, in one country for us. I think that perspective is defeated, even though there are those who still argue for it. This is a defeated perspective. Uh, as as uh, our ecological Marxists talk about, like Bellamy Foster, for example, we're talking about a me metabolic rift and the metabolism is global. And this is why it's really important for us to come together and have these exchanges so we can also have a global strategy. Thank you.